Hello everyone, my name is Gus. Hi, I'm Woody. Today, unfortunately, we uh, are reacting to the story of the death of one of our friends, Ben, who used to work for Dan, Divers Alert Network, and he recently passed away in Jackson Blue, cave diving. Um, so, somebody, obviously, you know, there's people that only live to look when somebody dies in a cave, just to rush to make a quick video about it, to get a lot of people to click on it so they can make some money um you know obviously they don't know anything about cave diving or rebreathers or ban or anyone they just want to make money really quick so that i guess you're saying that whoever is the commentary here yeah doesn't know what they're talking about yeah. is that great a douche uh making a video about dan uh, about ben from dan and you know i received a link to this video and they asked us to react to it i haven't watched it but, um, you know, the email where we got the suggestion was very clear that it is full of inconsistencies, bad information, speculations, because the death of Ben hasn't even been fully investigated and documented yet. So um, I feel like we owe it to Ben to go over it and give our thoughts. Okay. There is no other feeling than being surrounded by walls underwater with one source of light, feeling the weight of your equipment and oxygen coursing through your body. What? Cave diving. The sport has been around for years, but even in 2023, there are deadly consequences of entering a cave unprepared. Benjamin Strelnick, or Ben, was diving with a fellow co-worker on May 26th at Jackson Blue Cave. Ben was a certified cave diver, also a rebreather cave diver. He had a sidewinder on. He was prepared for this dive. And there's no oxygen about? flowing through your body. It's air or whatever gas he is. Yeah. They, they like to use the word oxygen yeah. for everything you're breathing. Oxygen tank. Yeah. Even Marina, Florida. When they decided to follow an established guideline that was tucked away off the main route, neither diver had ever entered this section of the cave before, and their curiosity was certainly stronger than their fear. By the way, the vast majority of time that we go cave diving, we go into places we haven't been. Like, what's the point of going to the same cave and do the same dive every time? You know what I'm saying? Like, every time we go to Genie or whatever, like Peacock Springs, whatever, we're like, where else haven't we been here? Have, we, have you been to the Crypt? Have you been to Woody's Room? Have you been to Rocky Horror Show? Like, we are looking at a map and finding the places we haven't been so we can go and check them out. Yeah, but so, that's different than cave exploration because these caves are already lined. Right. These are not. To, he was. They weren't exploring. Right. He's like, whoa. They went into a line off the main path. He said off the main line. So in other words, they made a jump and went into another area to go into an area of the cave where they haven't been. Ooh, that's literally what we do in almost every cave dive. Yeah, these are explored caves. Many people have been down these jumps. It's all on a map. This is not unexplored cave just to make it clear right but this one line would change their fate forever and have a lasting impact on the cave diving community this is their story that's terrible uh, terror twin terror twin that's the name of the channel oh i thought you, they were they're not subscribed Keep in mind, today's no. <laughs> video will talk about a recent tragedy, and I realize this can be a sensitive topic to some. Please be respectful to those affected. The details covering this story have not all been confirmed, and small details may change as you new facts say. are revealed. Ben Strelnick was 38 years old and described as a warm, open-minded, free-spirited, and adventurous person. He had Great a special guy. love for love outdoor ben. sports, particularly scuba diving. And he was well involved with his communities, even working for DAN, or Divers Alert Network, as or a that. medic in North Carolina where he lived. He also helped staff at a 24-7 hotline for scuba divers around the world, answering inquiries about underwater and dive-related emergencies. Ben was a doctor, by the way. They didn't mention that, but he worked at Dan as a doctor. You call if you have a malady, something related to diving, and he would answer the call and help you out through it. Ben was truly cherished by his colleagues and superiors at DAN for his breadth of knowledge, ability to explain complex medical concepts, and superb clinical judgment. Regardless how good of a diver one is, cave diving and scuba diving are completely different. Yes, both activities involve going underwater, and with both activities, a diver can suffer from nitrogen narcosis or being narked, 
When you inhale compressed air from an oxygen That's tank true. while under a lot of pressure from water, it increases the pressure of oxygen and nitrogen in your body. This increased pressure affects your central nervous system. Many divers describe that being narked is similar to feeling drunk. Ultimately though, cave diving and scuba diving each require different skill sets and training to be successful. For instance, in cave diving, you are in an enclosed area that may or may not have good visibility depending on if sediment was stirred before you. Water flow may help clear out this visibility or it may throw your body against the rocks if you run out of strength to fight it. You can't just go up, there's no natural light, and you may have to make life-impacting decisions under very stressful situations. To calmly deal with all this, diving simply requires time, effort, and proper training. There are no shortcuts. Okay. It's unclear I'm what exactly it. led Ben to start cave diving, but he would not become a cave certified diver until 2021. Another year would go by before he would receive his Sidewinder certification. The Sidewinder is a rebreathing device that was recently developed in 2016 and provides a balanced, light, small, but reliable device for divers. This device is the smallest rebreather available to the public and perfect That's for not cave true. diving. It was this device that Ben would be using on May 26th. It would be a closed circuit rebreather, which meant the device acted as a one-way breathing loop. One hose takes the gas exhaled by the diver to a CO2 scrubber, and another brings it back filtered, refreshed, and recycled to the diver's mouth. Florida is a hub for divers of all ages to commonly visit and train up their skills. The state has a wide variety of caves. Some are easy, some are long, and some caves are very dangerous. Jackson Blue Springs is a beautiful recreational park where many come to swim or enjoy the sun. But if you are brave enough to dive down into its depths, one can find a vast cave system that has been explored by beginners and experts. It's the perfect location for an afternoon dive. And so on May 26, Ben and a fellow DAN employee slash friend loaded up their slash gear friend. and set off for the spring. Overall, the weather was great. And when the two got to the park, it seemed like the correct decision to dive today. I'm unsure if there were divers directly in front of Ben, but I know that they were not the only ones in the cave that day. The flow of the water was normal for Jackson Spring, which is a moderate pool that can pick up throughout the cave depending on location, and the water appeared to be clear in front of them. It did not take long before the duo had done their necessary checks, thrown on their gear, put their mouthpieces in, and entered the cave. Overall, the Jackson Blue Cave system is pretty straightforward. You can see on the map, there's a single main passageway to follow. But what the map actually doesn't show you is that there are many small paths that have almost been forgotten about. It's not uncommon for some of these restrictions to already have a line laid, and unfortunately, inexperienced divers can sometimes take this as an invitation to go exploring. <clears throat> Many dive experts will advise those at Jackson Blue not to go into these smaller restrictions, simply because there is nothing to see, and it's not worth the risk. The duo descended to about 79 feet, which was close to the average depth of the cave. Once they stopped moving and gave each other the thumbs up, the divers both grabbed onto the guideline and began what? venturing further inside. They could see about 80 feet in front of them, but the white limestone rocks clearly stood out on either side. Now with cave diving, you have to be careful not to stir up the dirt resting at the bottom of the floor. Otherwise, you will silt out the cave and visibility can drastically change, with extreme cases making it impossible to see your hand in front of your face. The correct way to avoid this is by swimming parallel to the ground and kicking in controlled but outward fluid motion that stays close to your body. The goal is simple. Don't let your flippers touch the wall, floor, or roof. Although you are not moving fast with this motion, it is very important to adhere to it when cave diving. Over an hour had passed in the dive before the pair were nearing the first tee. Right before this intersection, however, is a small restriction that is hard to spot and not on the map. Ben's noticed this smaller restriction as they were passing by, but more importantly, saw that a guideline was leading down the passageway. Since there was a line, that meant someone had to have laid it which meant there had to have been a person that entered the restriction, found something, and came back out. Ben was intrigued and wanted to find out more. At this point, Ben and his diving buddy would have been well under the effects of nitrogen narcosis. Impossible for him to know that because he didn't know what gas Ben was using. But what I was about to say is that sometimes you do see line going through restrictions, but everyone is capable or everyone knows kind of their limit. 
when it comes to restrictions. And I take this line from my cave diving instructor, Dog Eversol, who said his limit is if I have to take gear off to go through the hole, I'm not doing it. Like that's my limit. I'm not going to attempt it. I'm not. If I try to go through and I find resistance, meaning I'm too big for it, I'm out. I won't do it. Right. So everyone has limitations and there are some restrictions that look impossible. Case in point, I think one of the most famous restrictions that seem impossible, that there's a line through it, is the line connecting Baptism Springs and Peacock Springs, which was famously connected by Agnes Miloka, who we've covered right here on the show. And they said that she connected the two. But people are saying that people seriously doubt that that happened because the hole, it's like the size of a red solo cup. It's like super, super small. People say that what they think it happened is that somebody came from one side, somebody came from another and handed the spool or the reel through the hole and said, all right, here, take it and connect the two. That's how they think it happened. Regardless of what it is, the two systems connected. There's a window. They pass the hand. If that was the case, Agnes, until the day she died, she said that she fit through the restriction and made it to the other side with the reel. She never passed it through. Um, but... There are some restrictions like that, that even though there's a line through it, there's other explanations of why the line can get through it. Doesn't necessarily mean that a person went through it, although for the vast majority of time, a person went through it. They were smaller, they were slimmer. However, they made it through. Doesn't mean you have to make it through. So, and we know that as cave divers. So for this guy to say that Ben looked at that and said, oh, there's a line through it. So might as well, somebody made it. That means we can make it. That's nonsense. No cave diver thinks like that. Just because there's a line through. I mean, you saw it with, uh, what was it? The cave, the the super tiny cave in uh, Florida. You went with Medi. I forgot the name. Shangri-La. Shangri-La. Yeah. There's a line through it. But at some point you're like, okay, my face is getting smushed. Sideways. Yeah. Between smushed. the bottom um, and the ceiling. So I'm not going. Right. So, uh, and for this guy to say that by this point, they were under the effect of narcosis. How do you know that? I think what I I just don't know. I, I'm not sure yet what to say about this. Jackson Blue to begin with is not that deep. All right. I'm not, I'm not to be under not even under air. And uh, without knowing the mix, you don't know that. Yeah, I'm not sure what to say about where they went, why they went there, and why he got stuck. I yeah. I, I don't know. Um I really am stuck on it because If you're going into something, I'm just I'm just trying to visualize it, and I haven't I haven't talked to them anybody about this. But if you're going into something, and you're you're kind of getting pretty stuck, usually at that point, you're not s continuing to wedge in where you're grinding the tank so hard to keep going forward that it's like right. breaking rock to where you can't back out. I mean, if you're pushing pretty hard, fine. I change my angle, but to get so stuck you really probably had to push pretty hard which is what's confusing me here yeah and i don't know i i would i don't understand how this happened let's keep watch so their judgment would have been a little impaired we also that have I don't to take into so. account that it is not uncommon for divers confidence to exceed themselves once the feeling of being narked begins i had to, to the fact I don't know that their vision not, would not there's no, nothing nonsense. i've heard about that yeah i have i do know the other person in, involved with this, and I have not heard anything no. about them being narked. Yeah, no, no. And th the other thing that he said is like, when divers get narked, they think they can do more than they can normally. It's like, what? He is clear either, and a small restriction may have appeared bigger than it actually was. Parallel to the ground, Ben slowly approached the opening. It was hard to see much inside, as the restriction was clearly silted out. But for some reason, Ben's ambition got the best of him, and his desire to explore the passage was overwhelming. Where, ben where, was the more who did this guy diver, talk to? So he to wanted get to nobody. take charge and be the first nobody. one in the restriction. Okay. Now remember, they were using a sidewinder breathing device, and when compared to a back mount, it is much smaller and workable in a tighter restriction. So mm -hmm. it may have added to their confidence. Many dive experts will tell you that just because you have a sidewinder does not mean you are ready to enter a trite restriction. Yep, of It course. takes advanced knowledge of your gear and a certain mentality to successfully traverse underwater cave restrictions. Nevertheless, yep. Ben grabbed the line 
kicked his feet, and began propelling himself into the passageway. Inch by inch, he entered deeper into the restriction. His visibility was blocked, so he was unaware of the white cave walls closing in around him. Every few seconds, Ben would push himself forward and repeat the process. Mm. He was unaware at first of the cave wall pushing up against him until the pressure was tight. His heart began to race as his body would not move forward, and he knew there was not enough room to turn around. If he was going to exit, he needed to back himself out of the hole. Ben began doing anything to calm his nerves. He knew that panicking would be a death sentence and needed to focus on a solution, but that can be easier said than done when you are scared. Ben's diving partner could not see very much inside the restriction either, but could tell something was wrong. Ben appeared to be wedged tight into a small opening and did not have room to maneuver around. The diver that was with Ben that day had even less experience than Ben and no experience on a closed circuit device. So again, I have to think that nitrogen narcosis was that person with Ben who I know was on open circuit. I don't know any of these facts. Do you I, know? I, I don't know because he said something there. So I don't know what he, he eluded the fact that that person has no experience on a rebreather. And I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But even if it was side mount open circuit to say that there was less experience and I'm trying to be careful here to not mention any names or anything. Um, but we cave know, diving. we know who it is. Less experience. Yeah. Cave diving. cave diving. I don't know if that's the case. I don't know. I don't know if I don't know how they know because we know both of them. Very and that's well. why I don't like this video because I'm going to continue to say I don't know. And I don't know how he knows. Impossible. Unless somebody I just don't know how this guy I knows it, all this. I think it's all made up. OK. Yeah, yeah, then, heavy then I, I wouldn't react very much decision like I'm making. doing. With little to no visibility, it was essentially impossible to help Ben without endangering his own life. I imagine he would attempt to help in whatever way possible trying to comfort Ben or theorizing his own solution, but the details here are unknown and it will most likely never be released for the public's knowledge. After some time had passed and it was clear that Ben could not get himself out of his situation alone, his diving partner would make the heart-wrenching decision to leave him down there alone and return to the surface to call for help. Although this decision will leave many with survivor's guilt, it was and will always be the correct call as it is always better to have one diver stuck versus two. Once the diver broke the surface, a call to authorities was made and a race against time began. Anyone knows that with cave diving rescues, time is the biggest factor for success. There is only a limited amount of air available in a tank and under intensely stressful situations, they may be breathing more rapidly, causing the oxygen to deplete faster. Wait, was, was Ben on a rebreather? Yes. For, okay. He was in a uh, sidewinder. So there's just so much say, said here that doesn't make sense that I am – I had to hit the pause button. Maybe you were going to hit it as well. I was going to smash my keyboard, yes. Okay. In order to run out of the oxygen that is just replacing the O2 that you metabolize, you probably – had to be in there for four to five hours. I just want to put it in perspective. I don't, and I don't know how long they were in there. Let, let me just finish. Sure. You also, in order to run out of, if he's misusing the word oxygen, which by the way, I believe he is. 100%. I think he's alluding to that he ran out of gas right. as if he bailed out and went onto his open circuit. Yeah. So now we're talking correctly about the situation right if that happened at all yeah then that's a lot of that is a lot of gas i mean he he may have panicked and was breathing super heavy and ran out of his gas his bailout yeah. gas and maybe he couldn't get to his other because he's wearing typical you are he was wearing two bailout tanks right now i i have heard a little bit and i hesitate to say this that when they found him, one of the tanks still had plenty of gas in it. I did hear that hearsay. So that means just as bad as this announcer may yep. not be true. I so, know but, some but, facts, but, but, but and I'm not going to be. That, but saying that he ran out of O2 and all of this, it's nonsense. that means you don't understand how a rebreather works. No. And, I, and, and that's why I wish these kind of videos were not out yet because. Or ever. We don't know. 
I don't know what he went through, why he got stuck. Um, you know, here's, it's frustrating because it's happened. so what easy is. to look back and make up these kinds of things, and it's just here's frustrating to me. I, okay. I can't even react properly. You have someone who is not even a diver because he keeps saying oxygen and flippers and stuff like that. So this guy's not even a diver, let alone a cave diver. This guy doesn't know Ben and Ben's buddy. It's clear from the things that he has been saying that he has no idea who the buddy is, okay? Number one. Number two, he keeps talking about the fact that he was in a sidewinder, but then to add drama and to make it more ominous, you then say, well, if you're stuck underwater, you're going to run out of oxygen. He's clearly using oxygen wrong. He's talking about air. And you're narked. And you're narked. And you're narked. And you think you can do more than you can. And you're about to run out of air. He was in a rebreather. He was in a sidewinder with hours, potentially, that he could breathe. Now, can you overbreathe your loop? Meaning, can you overbreathe your rebreather to the point that you feel you're not getting enough air and bail out to it? There's situations where that has been known to happen. And Mike has always warned us about that. Guys, the point where you don't want to be if you get stressed out or panic someday is to the point where you overbreathe your unit, where you feel you're not getting enough air and you have to bail out. He always warned us about this. It's like, you need to calm down. Your rebreather is giving you enough. Calm down. You're just overbreathing it. Okay. So could Ben be in a position where he was so concerned that yes. he felt that like he was overbreathing it and Definitely. he had to bail out? I would say he could have been. Yes. Sure. But. To say that he was narked and he was going to run out of oxygen, all this complete nonsense BS is just to add drama. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But if there's one person you want doing your cave rescue, that man would be Ed Sorensen. That Legendary I would agree cave with. diver we and even agree. more so famous for his cave rescues around the world. He was called in at about 12.30 p.m. But once they hung up, Ed and his team quickly sped over to Jackson Blue. It did not take long for a diver of his caliber to reach the location that Ben was stuck. And as they got closer, the silt from the restriction was more noticeable, but so was Ben. The sorrow feeling grew and grew as they got closer and closer, only to realize Ben had already passed away. It would take hours and a lot of manual work before his body was free from his wedge. Once on the surface, they discovered that one of Ben's tanks still had 2400 PSI left causing theories about his death to surface. One theory is that he was not able to maneuver enough to reach the tank mm. and therefore was unable to utilize it. Although this seems a bit of a stretch, the more likely scenario is that Ben was simply panicked, became overwhelmed, and drowned. However it happened, one thing is clear. Ben and his diving partner did not have enough sidewinder training to enter such a tight restriction, nor did they have the diver experience to know Ben could remain calm in that situation and especially when their minds were impaired. Regardless, this story has sparked a timeless debate in the cave diving community. The guideline Ben followed was part of a side passage, not on the main map, that had been laid within a thousand feet of the cave entrance. Most divers do not want to remove the line, but at the same time having lines so close to the entrance can cause new cave divers to follow them, unaware of the dangers around them. Hmm. At the end of the day though, Jackson Blue is a tourist cave, and will have beginners exploring its depths. It's a fact. So the Very more good. we can do to educate those to not be overconfident mm -hmm. or follow an unknown line, mm -hmm. the better. And although Ben lost his life, his story is a perfect example of being overconfident and too eager. I wanna end this story with a quote from Ben's mother. Ben knew the risk involved in scuba diving and would tell his mother, if I died diving, at least know that I died happy. That is a comfort to us all. I'm not I'm not opposed to the, what he did say in the end. I do think that if you're going to go into some of these tighter passages and you're a relatively new cave diver, I, I prefer – it's easier when I talk about myself. I prefer to do that with people that have a little bit of experience or have been there before me, Right. <laughs> frankly. I, I don't think that's such a bad thing. You can potentially – push yourself too far early on in your cave diving and i think it's better to be conservative with cave diving in your um unless you are with people that really really know those particular passageways i i i think that that's a valid comment yeah 
And I think, you know, the the lesson is to know your limits. And I think that goes beyond cave diving too. It goes into even open water. You know, there's people in open water that don't have the training and skills and do wreck penetrations and do all kinds of stuff. I think that knowing your limits is important with all kinds of diving. And, you know, I I can't I would I, I can't talk to Ben. So I don't know what he was thinking or or why he went into that place and, and panicked. I know, again, from me, from my own experience, I've been in situations that are sketchy, um, typically following the other Ben, Benjamin Woodle, uh, who's been on this channel several times. And we've been through places where it's been tight, you know, where I have to stop and think, like, calm down. And funny enough, I tell myself what we've been telling you this whole video is you have a rebreather, you have a sidewinder, you have hours to figure this out, calm down. And I think about Mike and I think about what he's told me. Don't panic. Don't overbreathe it. And I just calm myself down. Even trap like this. I'll be like, just calm down and then start figuring it out. One problem at a time. Oh, I can move this tank, but at the same time, I'm tangled. Okay, let me get out of this entanglement. Then let me move the tank. Like, stop and think and act. That's part of it. Um, yeah. But I don't necessarily think that's something everybody can do. Yeah. And I, I, I do also know that the same Mike that we're, you're talking about would tell you if he was sitting here, take it slow. Don't push your, put yourself into these kind of situations. Don't think you can become a cave explorer without years of experience. He's right. talking to both of us recently, like... Be careful on the channel, guys. You know, make yeah. sure you're not encouraging people to do things they're not ready for. Definitely not. I, I'm not ready for. I, you know, I'm not going to go cave exploring without Mike or right. without a cave explorer. Maybe it would be Ed. Maybe it would be Brian. Guys that are cave explorers for yeah. years. I don't even know how many years they've done it. I think that we can make cave diving. We can mitigate the risks of cave diving by following the rules conservatively. It's not just following the rules because I honestly, I don't want people to die cave diving. It's not, it doesn't have to happen. Think about this. There's a lot to see in Jackson Blue. There's so much to see. Yeah. Yeah. We gotta be careful. Yeah, and unfortunately several people uh, have passed away and have been rescued from Jackson Blue. We actually talked to Ed about one of those situations where we had to where he had to go in and rescue somebody. And I'm going to leave the video right here if you haven't seen it. Uh, the story from Ed is is crazy and I also want to leave, you know, on the screen a picture of Ben, you know, because we uh we met him, you know, several times before. Great guy, love to share a beer with him. And um, I just think this video was a disservice because not all the facts are out and it's impossible for him to know the claims that he's making. So yep. I feel bad about that. But anyway, if you haven't seen the video from Ed doing a rescue at Jackson Blue, I'm going to leave it right here. Go check it out and uh, save diving, right? Know yeah. your limits. Yeah. Bye, everybody.